Newspapers and magazines carried feature sections on him as one of the intellectuals of the new age. I couldn't believe that anyone who wrote these articles understood what he was saying in his book. I had my doubts they had even opened it, but such things were of no concern to them. All that mattered was that he was smart enough to write a book that nobody could understand. It made him famous. The magazines all came to him for critical pieces. He appeared on television to comment on political and economic questions. Soon, he was a regular panel member on one of the political debate shows. Those who knew him had never imagined him to be suited to such glamorous work. Everyone thought of him as the high-strung academic type, interested in nothing but his field of specialization. Once he got a taste of the world of mass media, though, you could almost see him licking his chops. He was good. He didn't mind having a camera pointed at him. If anything, he even seemed more relaxed in front of the cameras than the real world. We watched his sudden transformation in amazement. The man we saw on television wore expensive suits with perfectly matching ties and eyeglass frames of fine tortoise shell. His hair had been done in the latest style. He'd obviously been worked on by a professional. I'd never seen him exude such luxury before, and even if he had been outfitted by the network, he wore the style with perfect ease, as if he had dressed that way all his life. Who was this man? I wondered when I first saw him. In front of the cameras, he played the role of man of few words. When asked for an opinion, he would state it simply, clearly, and precisely. Whenever the debate heated up and everyone else was shouting, he kept his cool. When challenged, he would hold back, let his opponent have his say, and then demolish the person's argument with a single phrase. He had mastered the art of delivering the fatal blow with a purr and a smile. On the television screen, he looked far more intelligent and reliable than in real life. I'm not sure how he accomplished this. He certainly wasn't handsome, but he was tall and slim and had an air of good breeding. In the medium of television, Nabora Watea had found the place where he belonged. The mass media welcomed him with open arms and he welcomed them with equal enthusiasm. What a bunch of utter postmodern neo Marxist drivel. In this video, we're going to talk about Jordan Peterson. This video is, in the loosest possible sense, a sequel to the second video I ever made called Jordan Peterson is a Fraud Part 1, Bill C-16. Extremely catchy title, I know. I made that video almost three years ago, and at the end of it, I said that I was going to make a second one where I'd read a bunch of Derrida and debunk Peterson's arguments about postmodern neo-Marxism, and uh, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I'm sorry, everyone. I'm sorry, Dr. Peterson. I know you're watching this. Uh, better professors than you at the University of Toronto tried and failed to make me read Derrida when I was a student there, so honestly, what hope did you possibly have? I had a lot of trouble writing this script, and I think if I'm being honest, it's because Jordan Peterson is kind of responsible for me starting this channel. I went to school with both of his kids from elementary through high school. I studied at the University of Toronto, studying English and sociology, specifically focused on critical theory. And so after graduating, on the day Donald Trump got elected, I was disillusioned, underemployed and not sure what to do with my life. And then 
I started seeing this Kermit motherfucker who looks like the villain from Half-Life blowing up for rebranding William Lynn's paleoconservatism, and I just thought, okay, let's fucking go. For anyone who's never heard of Jordan Peterson before, just go. It's not too late for you. You could just close this video and go on enjoying your life with absolutely no knowledge of all beef diets, medically induced comas, or incestuous lobster kink play. You could be so happy. Okay, now that those freaks are gone, let me go through a bit of a recap before we move on to the main event. Jordan Peterson is a psychology professor at the University of Toronto, and even before he became famous, he was an extremely popular lecturer. A friend of mine took his course in first year and described him as exactly what he'd imagined an eccentric university professor would be like. Like, they'd watch Pinocchio in class, and Peterson would pause it to run to the front shouting shit like, There! That's the Great Father! Coincidentally, that is also what his kids say whenever they look at their bank accounts. Another fun fact is that Peterson had always been an avid supporter of the free exchange of ideas. In his lectures, he would apparently offer to debate anyone who disagreed with anything he'd said, just in the lecture hall, surrounded by all the other students who adored him. This is a minor thing, but it is also so fucked up. Like, disagreeing with your professor as a student is already really intimidating. Just imagine some 18-year-old nervous to talk to the guy who has so much power over their life, and he's just like, hang on, I want to get all your peers here to watch me own you. Peterson initially rose to fame when, in the fall of 2016, he released a series of videos to his YouTube channel voicing his opposition to Bill C-16, a bill which would add trans and gender nonconforming people to the list of groups protected by the Canadian Human Rights Act and the Criminal Code. I talked about this in my original video about him, but in case you'd rather not watch it because it's bad, uh, here's a brief recap. Also, it's funny, like, the two videos of mine that get lots of negative comments are my first two, debunking Jordan Peterson and Ben Shapiro, and it's a weird experience because I hate those videos too, but for extremely different reasons. Like, all the comments are calling me a lib cuck, and I'm just like, the editing looks like garbage. Anyways, Peterson's worries about the bill infringing on free speech have been completely debunked by the head of the Canadian Bar Association. Also, it's now almost five years later and no one's been arrested for misgendering people. Peterson, of course, insisted that his objection was in no way motivated by bigotry, although he did also say in his now taken down video titled Professor Against Political Correctness Part 1, Fear and the Law, that the reason he didn't trust the Premier of Ontario at the time was because she was a lesbian. So. The reason I think the Ontario Human Rights Commission is, is an emblematic institution in this regard is partly because I think that the that social justice warrior type activists are overrepresented in the current um, provincial government, fed, or the current liberal provincial government, and I can't help but shake this, I can't help but manifest the suspicion that that's partly because our current um, premier is lesbian in her sexual preference, and that in and itself doesn't bother me one way or another. I don't think it's relevant to the political discussion, except insofar as the LBGT community has become extraordinarily good at organizing themselves. From here, Peterson became wildly popular and his career skyrocketed. To me, I think a lot of this success comes from him being, for a lot of his fans, their first time experiencing a charismatic humanities professor. Peterson wrote a wildly popular self-help book called 12 Rules to Life and toured the world giving talks. For a while there, he was like the run the jewels of right-wing events, an indie breakout featured at just every festival. 
But this all took a toll on Peterson's health. In late 2016, following the advice of his daughter Michaela, he began a strict all-beef diet. In 2019, his wife was diagnosed with cancer, and Peterson, in order to cope, had the dosage of his anti-anxiety medication increased. He then suffered a paradoxical reaction in early 2020, and finding all other treatments ineffective, his daughter Michaela took him to a Russian rehab clinic where he was placed into a medically induced coma. I want to be very clear here that while Jordan Peterson is a bad person and quite often hilarious, addiction is an illness, not a personal failure, and I don't think that he should be mocked or called a hypocrite for this. And now, Peterson is back with 12 more rules. First of all, I've seen people say that this is some low-effort grift and he just shat these out because he needs money for stakes and Soviet art. Oh yeah, another weird side thing with Peterson is that his house is filled with communist propaganda. This is partly because he thinks that he's owning the libs by buying Soviet art. That's cool. And then I thought it was so funny. I just couldn't stand the irony of this, the world's most capitalistic enterprise. It's just eBay, right? It's just free trade. Mm -hmm. That's all it is, right? Yeah. Unregulated free trade. Now I could buy Soviet artifacts. <laughs> that's 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 so that funny. Is, so I could is, buy yeah. like Karl Marx posters <laughs> on eBay, oh, is... discounted. It's like, yes! Even though capitalism is workers selling their labor to the owners of the means of production, not just commerce. Uh, but also, Peterson, having grown up in the Cold War, has an existential fear of communism. And so he covers his house in their iconography to, like, remind himself of that. Now, I am not a clinical psychologist, but this strikes me as some pretty fucking weird behavior. Like, imagine you went over to someone's house and there were just pictures of spiders everywhere. So you were like, oh, do you like spiders? And then they go, no, they terrify me. If ever happens, get the fuck out of that house because someone dressed as a spider is going to drop a net on you. Anyway, while people are probably right to be a little bit confused, since Peterson did write in the intro of his last book that he only wanted 12 rules because too many rules leads to tyranny, uh, both these and his last 12 rules came from a Quora post, which he is ridiculously proud of, in which he wrote 42 rules to life. So uh, buckle up, people, because we still have 18 more rules coming. <laughs> now, on to this book. Personally, I find Peterson's writing style really annoying. When he's speaking, he has this disorganized way of talking where he'll sort of go off on tangents that I do actually find really engaging. He has this way of making anything he talks about feel like you're listening to someone who's excited to explain something complex that they're really interested in. His writing is done in the exact same style though, which to me is very irritating. I always hear people say how he's extremely careful in his speech, and I never agreed, since to me, careful speech means conveying as much meaning as possible in the fewest number of words. Having read his book, I think I now understand that for Peterson, speaking carefully means making a point and then including an exhaustive list of examples in which that point is true, as well as any instances in which it isn't. So like, I had always seen this tendency in his speech as him just rambling, which again, I always found pretty charming, but not very precise. Reading it in his book, though, has made it very clear that this is an intentional choice, and also, this is just my opinion here, makes the book really unpleasant to read. There are many reasons, for example, why people are poor. Lack of money is the obvious case. But that hypothetical obviousness is part of the problem with ideology. Lack of education, broken families, crime-ridden neighborhoods, alcoholism, drug abuse, criminality and corruption, and the political and economic exploitation. That when you are visited by chaos and swallowed up, when nature curses you or summon you love with illness, or when tyranny rends asunder something of value that you have built, it is salutary to know mental illness, lack of a life plan, or even failure to realize that formulating such a plan is possible or necessary. 
low conscientiousness, unfortunate geographical locale, shift in the economic landscape, and the consequent disappearance of entire... Rule 2 analyzes a centuries-old alchemical image, relying on several stories, ancient and the marked proclivity of those who are rich to get richer still, and the poor to get poorer. Low creativity slash entrepreneurial rule 8 focuses on the vital importance of aesthetic experience as a guide to what is true. These are but a few of the manifold problems that generate poverty. But this video is not going to be about Peterson's new book. Maybe I'll make one of those in three years. If you're interested in that, I'd recommend checking out Cass Aris, who has a PhD in psychology and reviews Peterson's work in detail on her channel. Instead, for this video, I want to zero in on one specific issue, the idea of Jordan Peterson as an intellectual. A common critique I hear all the time, including from people I generally really like, is that Jordan Peterson isn't a real intellectual, or maybe worse, that he's a sign of the decline of the public intellectual. I saw one really funny article that talked about how horrible it is that Peterson is considered a public intellectual, but if you look at Albert Einstein's Wikipedia page, it doesn't call him that. It's like, I don't know, it's Wikipedia, go fucking change it if it's bothering you so much. The way this criticism then goes is that they'll usually say something to the effect of, Peterson knows what he's talking about with psychology, but he's completely wrong when he steps out of his field. And like, that's true. Peterson has pretty regularly demonstrated a total lack of understanding of the Canadian legal system, postmodernism, Marxism, just to name a few. And lots of his critics, myself included, have used this to say that he's a bad intellectual. But really, stepping outside your field of expertise is kind of what public intellectuals do. The economist John Maynard Keynes once said that the job of the public intellectual is to perform at one and the same time the tasks appropriate to the economist, to the financier, to the politician, to the journalist, to the propagandist, to the lawyer, to the statesman, even, I think, to the prophet and to the soothsayer. The concept of the public intellectual dates back to France in the 1890s when Captain Alfred Dreyfus was wrongfully convicted of treason and sentenced to life in prison for allegedly leaking military secrets to the Germans. Two years after his initial arrest in 1894, new evidence came to light that showed that Dreyfus was innocent and that the real culprit was a major named Ferdinand Esther Hazy. And while you might think that this would have exonerated Dreyfus. Due to the nature of French law at the time, this was actually a pretty tricky and nuanced issue. You see, while Dreyfus was innocent of the crime he was convicted for, he was unfortunately guilty of being Jewish. And so, in accordance with the French legal system at the time, the army suppressed all evidence against Esther Hazy, forged legal documents to show his innocence, and then exonerated him in a trial which lasted only two days. Just basic French law stuff, really. The Dreyfus Affair, as it came to be known, completely divided French society between those who supported the release of Alfred Dreyfus, who came to be known as the Dreyfusards, and those who supported the army and also anti-Semitism, known as the anti-Dreyfusards. I'm just kidding, by the way, lots of the Dreyfusards were also anti-Semites. This polarization and debate was largely sparked by an open letter titled J'accuse by French writer Emile Zola. Zola, along with a group of authors, academics, and journalists, came together to advocate for the release of Dreyfus. This is largely seen as the first time intellectuals emerged as a unified class. The class was soon given the name intellectuals, funnily enough, as a pejorative used by the anti-Dreyfusards who were pissed off at these elitist libs deciding that they knew what was best. I mean, what gives these eggheads the right to tell the French people not to imprison an innocent man because of his religion? As Patrick Barrett writes, In spite of their political differences, both Dreyfusards and anti-Dreyfusards attributed roughly the same meaning to the concept. 
for both intellectuals were a diverse group of people that included journalists, novelists and university professors who intervened publicly in the name of abstract principles such as justice and equality, who portrayed themselves as a progressive force in line with Republican values and who saw themselves as suspicious of and invariably in opposition to the state. Now, the Dreyfusards were correct, and I don't want to diminish the fact that a lot of them, especially Zola, were being incredibly brave. Zola's letter is actually pretty badass in kind of an Aaron Sorkin way, except Zola actually challenged the powers that be. He addressed his open letter to the president of France and was just a huge dick in it, specifically in the hopes of getting sued for libel, since that would force the French government to provide proof that Dreyfus was guilty which they couldn't do because there wasn't any. Regardless, I think the anti-Dreyfusards unintentionally raised a bit of a good question. Why do journalists, authors, and academics receive this special role in our society? It's weird, right? Like, why are those specific professions special? What I think it stems from is that the only thing that they all had in common was that at that time, success in those fields translated to access to a mass audience. Or, as Bert puts it, they all had access to the intellectual means of production. Barrett points out that even from the beginning, there were some problems with the idea of public intellectuals. The biggest issue is that even with the Dreyfus Affair, the intellectuals who spoke out about the intricacies of the court case weren't legal experts, and while they were correct, they could have just as easily been wrong. The Dreyfus art intellectuals presented themselves as experts, but not because they had any special information or expertise. They weren't lawyers and were working off the same information that the rest of the public had. What they claimed gave their perspective more weight was that unlike the regular people who were just as informed about the case as they were, the intellectuals were smart. And hey, I'm not saying that these people or their contemporary counterparts weren't smart. Probably the most classic example of a public intellectual is Jean-Paul Sartre, and that dude was smart as Balls. I mean, have you read Being in Nothingness? That shit's a certified banger, baby. I mean, I haven't read it because my brain's as smooth as glass washing up on the beach, but smart people say it's smart, so... But, like, there are smart people everywhere. Like, I know people who wash dishes for a living who've read, I'm sure, at least as much philosophy as Peterson, a dude who, despite having made a career speaking about it, hadn't read Marx until he needed to debate a communist raccoon. What I did instead was return to what I regarded as the original cause of all the trouble, let's say, which was the Communist Manifesto. And what I attempted to do, because that's Marx, and we're here to talk about Marxism, let's say. And um, what I tried to do was read it. I read it when I was 18. It was a long time ago, right? That's 40 years ago. But Which, like, same, bro. I'm phoning this shit in, too. But still. I'm sure it's also just a totally random coincidence that Sartre is remembered as this revered public intellectual, but Simone de Beauvoir isn't. I don't know, it's probably not something that's worth talking about until at least towards the end of this video. The issue here, though, is that the authority of public intellectuals kind of begs the question. We should take them seriously as authorities because they're taken seriously as authorities. In other words, you could say that their authority is seen as justifying itself. And to quote Peter Kropotkin, that sucks. Well, I'm not saying necessarily that public intellectuals all have to perfectly follow the principles of anarchism. I mean, no one's perfect. It's a little weird that these people are enforcing this very old and elitist hierarchy while supposedly, at least in the case of the Dreyfusards, fighting for progressive values in the hope of liberation. It's like, 
where do they get off acting like they're so perfect that they get to go around pretending they're these noble warriors fighting for justice in our society? Wait a second. By now, you might have noticed that some of this criticism sounds an awful lot like the kind of thing you'd see a guy in Oakley's film himself ranting about in his car, saying that celebrities have no business telling people who to vote for, or that cancel culture took away Lola Rabbit's big naturals. And when we hear these types of criticisms, I think a lot of people, myself included in this, will say how, while I don't get my politics from celebrities and don't think that you should either, if someone has access to a big platform, it's basically good if they use that to spread a good message. But like, this is more a matter of making the most of a bad situation. In my ideal society, I would not want people to get their like political education from award show acceptance speeches. Obviously, people should only be getting their politics from YouTubers. But although I think very often these conservatives don't really care much about re-examining whose voices are amplified and rearranging society to become more egalitarian, but rather just want anyone with a progressive message to shut up, I do, however, think that there is something to this line of criticism. Meanwhile, I couldn't stand the sight of him, in print or on TV. He was a man of talent and ability to be sure, I recognize that much. He knew how to knock his opponent down quickly and effectively with the fewest possible words. He had an animal instinct for sensing the direction of the wind, but if you paid close attention to what he was saying or what he had written, you knew that his words lacked consistency. They reflected no single worldview based on profound convictions. His was a world that had been fabricated by combining several one-dimensional systems of thought. He could rearrange the combination in an instant, as needed. These were ingenious, even artistic, intellectual permutations and combinations, but to me, they amounted to nothing more than a game. If there was any consistency to his opinions, it was the consistent lack of consistency. And if he had a worldview, it was a view that proclaimed his lack of a worldview. But these very absences were what constitute his intellectual assets. Consistency and an established worldview were excess baggage in the intellectual mobile warfare that flared up in the mass media's tiny time segments, and it was his great advantage to be free of such things. He had nothing to protect, which meant that he could concentrate all his attention on pure acts of combat. He needed only to attack, to knock his enemy down. Noboru Wateo was an intellectual chameleon, changing his color in accordance with his opponents, ad-libbing his logic for maximum effectiveness, mobilizing all the rhetoric at his command. I had no idea how he had acquired these techniques, but he clearly had the knack of appealing directly to the feelings of the mass audience. He knew how to use the kind of logic that moved the great majority. Nor did it even have to be logic, it only to appear so as long as it aroused the feelings of the masses. Trotting out the technical jargon was another forte of his. No one knew what it meant, of course, but he was able to present it in such a way that you knew it was your fault if you didn't get it. He was always citing statistics. They were engraved in his brain and they carried tremendous persuasive power, but if you stop to think about it afterwards, you realize that no one had questioned his sources or their reliability. These clever tactics of his used to drive me mad, but I was never able to explain to anyone exactly what upset me so. I was never able to construct an argument to refute him. It was like boxing with a ghost. Your punches just swished through the air. There was nothing solid for them to hit. I was shocked to see even sophisticated intellectuals responding to him. It would leave me feeling strangely annoyed. And so, Nabora Watea came to be seen as the most intelligent figure of the day. Nobody seemed to care about consistency anymore. All they looked for on the tube were the bouts of intellectual gladiators. The redder the blood they drew, the better. 
It didn't matter if the same person said one thing on Monday and the opposite on Thursday. Now, let's take a step away from what public intellectuals are and instead focus a bit on how they operate. One of the key things they tend to do is form groups. We can see this with the Dreyfusards in France, the Frankfurt School in Germany, and with the intellectual dark web now. By the way, a pack of intellectuals is actually called a TED Talk or to use the scientific term, a way for rich liberals to assure themselves that they deserve to occupy an elite section of society in spite of their supposedly progressive values. For anyone blissfully unaware, the Intellectual Dark Web, or IDW, is a loose collection of right-leaning public figures, including Ben Shapiro, Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris, Brett and Eric Weinstein, Joe Rogan, and Dave Rubin, as well as some more periphery figures such as Douglas Murray, Christina Hoff Summers, Steven Pinker, Gad Saad, and Lindsay Shepard. The main architect behind the IDW, as well as the guy who coined that simply epic name, is Eric Weinstein. One very funny thing about Eric is that he gets really defensive any time someone claims that the IDW has lost relevance. The other, my other sort of frame of the intellectual dark web at the beginning, or my hope for it, was this sense of, could this be like public intellectuals coming together for sort of very high profile events. Yeah, and my hope, I guess, with the first uh, emergence of the intellectual dark was, was that we might get a sense of this sort of synthesis developing. Yeah. I, I don't think I've, I've seen that over the last couple of years. Was that Sorry, with whom? But with whom? But what's really interesting about Eric is how he talks about the aims of the intellectual dark web. Weinstein says that his goal is for the IDW to become a communal sense-making platform that will replace the traditional media. For one thing, I have to admit, I severely underestimated Eric Weinstein. I never thought he'd come up with a more cringe series of words than intellectual dark web. But anyways, this doesn't just mean amplifying the voices that supposedly aren't being featured on the mass media because what a tragedy it is that Stefan Molyneux can't discuss race science on CNN. But Eric's ambitions are greater than that. He doesn't just want to be featured on mass media, he wants to replace it and for the IDW to become a dominant, to use his term, sense-making platform which will curate what news people do and don't hear. What the intellectual dark web actually is is an alternative sense-making collective. So, in this case, the so-called IDW will take what is ever happening in the world and will try to analyze it. But very often, it sounds very different than what you see in typical mainstream publications, particularly those that we on the left uh, have depended upon for uh, curating the interpretations of what is happening in the world. You see this again with Jordan Peterson's efforts to create a database of Marxist and postmodern professors who he wants to blacklist. I thought for a while that it would be useful for the, for the, for, 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 for the political systems, people who are running the political systems, to consider doing something like cutting the funding of universities by 25% and letting them fight over the remains. And hopefully what that would mean... Hopefully that would mean that the pseudo-disciplines such as women's studies, which never had a methodology, to, to, to methodology that was credible to begin with, and I would put in the same classification all the ethnic and racial studies groups that are popping up on campuses like MAD under the guise of, of, of true disciplines, which they're not in any sense of the imagination, but also, or any sense of the word, but also increasingly the social sciences and the general humanities that have been corrupted quite terribly by the postmodern doctrines. I thought, well, maybe it would be good to see if the funding could be cut for them. Anyways, new real peer review picked up where they stopped and has been publishing abstracts like MAD from these crazy postmodern journals, uh, which are journals only in name. And so I started to pull out key key words, well I'll tell you a little bit about that game in a minute, um, I started to pull out key words that were emblematic of the, let's call it the postmodern cult, and then I thought I'd generate a questionnaire that, that parents of 
university students and, and late stage high school students and freshmen in university and maybe second year students could use as a guideline so they could look at the course descriptions and check off word frequency from the postmodern list and decide that if the course was part of the postmodern cult that they should maybe just not take it. But then I got um, a real interesting email from a guy, uh, I won't tell you his name yet, but who's a computer programmer and he put together an AI system to parse apart postmodern the postmodern lexicon automatically and he set up a website now where students can feed in course descriptions of any sort and it will spit out whether or not they're postmodern. This is, one might say, odd behavior for a man as supposedly worried about free speech in academia as Jordan Peterson. But it's because the goal here isn't for these renegade academics to be included, but rather for them to be the ones who do the excluding. They don't want equality. They want power. For one thing, I think that this explains the IDW's claims that they're these censored and ignored underdogs, but it's because the members are all podcasters, YouTubers, journalists, authors, and academics who just aren't the types of people who tend to get much airtime on the mainstream media to begin with. More like lamestream media, am I right, folks? Shit, that was good. Has anyone ever said that before? This also brings me to another big factor in all of this, the changing media landscape. I think this is kind of why you'll see these boomer think pieces lamenting the death of the public intellectual. It's because while we've hung on to this image of public intellectuals as like learned men of consequence debating ideas, authors, academics, and journalists aren't really the ones who shape culture anymore. As public intellectual Jurgen Habermas points out, this isn't so much because there aren't smart people anymore, but rather that newer types of media require a degree of self-promotion that traditional academics aren't typically suited for. And while Habermas was just talking about TV, this has become even more of an issue with the internet and social media. In Barrett's paper, he talks about positioning theory, a school of analysis that focuses on the ways in which, in this case, a speaker's position affects their message. For example, if someone is speaking on television, that might confer a greater sense of authority, but also limits what they're able to say. The same is true of academic journals. Generally, authoritative platforms come with the downside of limitations on what you're allowed to use them for. But Barrett notes, a little optimistically I would say, that the internet has disrupted all of this. There aren't really any gatekeepers anymore if you're talking on a podcast or YouTube. I should know, I've had people say that I'm some kind of expert in sociology, and while that's very nice, I should be clear that if you took out all the jokes, most of my videos would basically just qualify as a B-plus undergrad research essay. Also, a really funny thing I noticed while researching this video is that there's tons of scholarly literature about the idea of public intellectuals because academics fucking love writing about themselves, but everything written from like 2010 to around 2015 or so is extremely optimistic about the role of the internet in democratizing information. And then everything after 2016 is fucking blackpilled. But I think this is something that the IDW has really used to their advantage. As Curio points out in their amazing video on the subject, the intellectual dark web is actually an amazing description of these people since in addition to being cringe as fuck, they're able to present themselves as authorities by using all of the aesthetics of classical intellectuals without the pesky downside of having to be held to any of the classical standards. Ben Shapiro is a lawyer in his 30s who tours college campuses debating freshmen. Sam Harris wrote a laughably bad book about philosophy. Whatever the fuck it is Dave Rubin and Tim Poole do, it certainly isn't journalism. And Jordan Peterson constantly says things in interviews that are hilariously wrong. Habermas wrote that the authority of intellectuals comes from the fact that they're held accountable not just by the general public, but by fellow experts in their field. 
For the good reputation of an intellectual, assuming she has one, is not based primarily on celebrity or fame, but on a standing which has to be acquired in her own field, whether as a writer or a psychiatrist, at any rate in some specialist field, before she makes a public use of her knowledge and reputation. When she contributes arguments to a debate, she must address a public composed not of viewers, but of potential speakers and addressees who are able to offer each other justifications. And the intellectual dark web responded, says who? I should also say here that this isn't me arguing for closing off academia. There's been a movement in sociology, for instance, where scholars have argued that they should become private intellectuals only writing for other sociologists, and I obviously think that this is a completely wrong approach. Jordan Peterson had an initial presence on YouTube because he would upload all of his lectures for free, which is genuinely a really cool thing to do. What I'm arguing arguing for here is a greater cynicism towards the authority of these people calling themselves intellectuals, especially when the only gatekeeper is YouTube's algorithm. Now, let's take a step back here to figure out how the project of the IDW operates. One thing they love to bring up is how diverse the group is. Purely ideologically speaking, of course. While the individual members of the intellectual dark web hold a variety of views ranging from paleoconservatism to neoconservatism to libertarianism, they're united by a common hatred of political correctness, cancel culture, postmodernism, contemporary progressive social movements, trans people, and Muslims, or as they call that, reasonable thinking. I think it's interesting here to point out the way that the IDW and Peterson in particular work to present their arguments as natural. The idea that one of the driving forces between history is hierarchical struggle is absolutely true. But the idea that that's actually history is not true because it's deeper than history, it's biology itself because organisms of all sorts organize themselves into hierarchies. The postmodern neo-Marxist Antonio Gramsci viewed history as a struggle between ways of viewing reality. Moving away from the Marxist concept of false consciousness, the idea that the reason the working class doesn't act in its best interests is because they've been tricked. Instead, Gramsci argued that that's not only kind of condescending, like if someone isn't supporting your cause, it's probably not the best to say that it's just because they're suckers, but also this misses that people don't often decide what they believe by objectively looking at their finances. I mean, do you have any idea how many Chinese puzzle boxes I've bought since the start of the pandemic? Every surface in my room is covered with them, none of which I've solved. And this is not because it's rational or economically sound. No, 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 very much the opposite. But it'll have all been worth it once I finally solve one. Instead, as Kenneth Burke later put it, people use a narrative to make sense of their material conditions and base their beliefs off of that. This relates to Gramsci's ideas on common sense, which ironically are actually really confusing and there's a lot of disagreement about what he meant. Like Every scholarly paper on it is like, everyone else who's written about this is a dumbass, but what he actually meant was this. I mean, the guy did write all of this while in a classic case of cancel culture run amok, he was imprisoned for opposing Mussolini. So maybe we should cut him a bit of slack there. In that sense, you could say he was the Jordan Peterson of his time. Gramsci, without going too into it here, described common sense as the assemblage of truisms accepted within a particular social world. And dude was not a fan. He basically thought that common sense was contradictory and usually dumb as hell, but that the intellectual's job was to criticize common sense and take the couple kernels of truth at the core of it and use those to create a new philosophy to challenge the dominant one. I would argue, though, that far from challenging common sense, the members of the IDW try to justify it by inserting themselves into it, claiming to be such reasonable thinkers, and insisting that all their views are just what's natural. 
Peterson goes harder into this than I think anyone else I've ever seen. From his lobster dominance hierarchies to his somewhat infamous debate with Sam Harris in which he argued that God is real because religion is evolutionarily beneficial and truth is whatever is evolutionarily beneficial. I don't want to be too hard on him here because I'm not making this up. He blames his poor performance in that debate on having drinking apple cider and gone a month with no sleep. Jordan Peterson hates and fears apple cider so much he's probably going to cover his house with giant portraits of it soon. But I mean, come on, we've all been there. I've said absolutely ridiculous shit after drinking sulfites. But the thing is, Peterson does not seem to have let this go and brings it up in current interviews. So. Yeah. This is part of why it's really useless to try to debunk him. Peterson's operating on a level of pure ideology where he thinks that things can be factually true but still wrong if they don't fit his idea of what's evolutionarily advantageous. And just for the record, for all the shit Derrida gets, if you open up one of his books, you might find erotic Socrates fan fiction, but you won't find any of this shit. I am not aware of any philosopher, postmodern or otherwise, who goes as hard as Peterson does in redefining truth to suit their own interests. Part 3. Yep, we're, we are doing parts now. I just decided that. Those were parts one and two back there. And if you don't like it, fuck you, I changed my mind. This is part four. Part four. Burn it all down. So, knowing what we do now, I think we can come to a better definition of what a public intellectual is. In a paper by Lambros Fatsis, they argue that a public intellectual isn't so much a job as it is what Fatsis calls a space for opinion. Also, I know that was an incredibly pretentious thing to say. Don't worry, it gets so much worse. It's kind of like how a worker isn't a member of the proletariat because of the specifics of the job that they do, but because of the circumstances surrounding that work. In the same way, public intellectuals aren't defined by any specific quality or type of thinking, but just that people listen to them. And Fatsis argues that that sucks. In Gramsci's critique of intellectuals, he notes that it's impossible for them to be detached observers, as some like to claim to be, and so we need to always see any truth bombs and hot takes made by public intellectuals as inherently a product of their material and historical circumstances. But Faxis goes a bit further. Our whole idea of intellectuals is as these philosopher kings talking down to regular people, and so if something like their class can seep into their ideas, why wouldn't their elitist position? So yeah, maybe public intellectuals are just a bad thing, period. Like, one issue with them is obviously diversity. I mean, of course it almost goes without saying that almost all public intellectuals are white and even more are men, but also there are other types of smart people besides academics, journalists, and authors. What if we heard from different types of artists? Why are authors so special? What if we valued lived experiences a bit more? Why is a homeless person's opinion on the state of homeless shelters not taken at least as seriously as that of some guy with a PhD in an unrelated field? I want to be very clear here, I'm not saying get rid of smart people or don't listen to experts, but honestly ask. Why is it good for us to just have designated professional smart people? I know it's kind of scary, a world without think pieces and TED Talks, a world where professors can no longer turn the dislike they feel towards their trans students into a lucrative career, a world where we maybe place more value on the intelligence of regular people. But I think in spite of all of that, it might be a world worth considering. Okay, but also I should still be able to do this as a job though because Bad people who threaten
Captain thought good once They threatened the West Which is mine So we've been told and demand to believe it I never wrong, just eat me Someday we'll find them the cultural Marxists, the fascists, the grifters, and me. Who said that everyone gets dignity now? What an entitled Modernists who tear family down to change all the words they ought. What's so amazing that keeps them all blazing despite our polite bigotry? A cultural Marxist, the fascists, the grifters, and me. Most of us white as hell, proclaiming a post racial era. Have you been half asleep? And have you heard voices? Just the